I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay. Madam Clerk, would you please read the roll call? With pleasure. Uh, Councilmember Gothels? Here. Councilmember Pappen? Here. Councilmember Lee? Here. Deputy Mayor Bonilla? Here. And Mayor Rodriguez is absent due to a scheduled vacation. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, next, I'm going to give the uh, COVID uh, information that we start every meeting with. Due to the health orders in place at this time, we're holding meetings remotely. Information on how to provide public comment is explained at the bottom of each published agenda. When public comment is announced for the item you wish to comment on, when signed into the Zoom call, use the raise your hand feature and you will be called on at the appropriate time. If calling via telephone, press star nine to raise your hand when you hope to speak and when called upon, press six to unmute yourself. These options for public comment will remain available until I close the public comment period for that specific item. Very good. Next, we have uh, ceremonial items. And the first ceremonial item will be the National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week proclamation. Um, and I'm looking for the proclamation. Do we have somebody to read the proclamation, uh, Madam Clerk? Rick, it was sent with your script. Joan sent to you. Okay. No, I didn't see it, but let me see if I can find it right here. Hold on one minute. Joan sent it this afternoon. No, she sent it on Friday. Okay. Let me just search, uh, Joan. I, I'm looking for it now. I will forward it to you. Okay. I just sent it to you again, Rick. Okay, good. And there it is. And I need to open it. Very good. We have the 2021 National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. And whereas the trials of this past year have demonstrated the importance of quality 911, as public safety professionals have coordinated emergency services efficiently, ensured the health and safety of residents, and served as the first and most critical contact to citizens in crisis. And whereas we respect dispatch professionals for their handling of frequent life and death emergencies and the high standard they set in performing their duties in a diligent and compassionate manner. And whereas Dispatch Appreciation Week, known nationally as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, recognizes public safety telecommunicators of the city of San Mateo who have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. And whereas each dispatcher has exhibited kindness, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job in the past year, and we commend their devotion, contributions, and service. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the City of San Mateo, the City Council of San Mateo, hereby recognizes the week of April 11th through April 17th, 2021, as Dispatch Appreciation Week, in honor of the men and women whose diligence for professionalism keep our city and citizens safe. Enacted this day, April 5th, 2021, by the San Mateo City Council. And I think we're looking for some comments possibly from Marie Silva. 
Hello, thank you very much for the acknowledgement. We're very fortunate to have a strong team of 911 professionals devoted to the mission of service in our city. Even more so during the pandemic, they work selflessly adapting to the significant changes impacting the work environment, their families and their community. They truly are 911 heroes. Thank you for acknowledging our profession this evening and service. Great, thank you very much. And um, I, I can't tell you how much uh, we truly appreciate the services that uh, our professional uh, safety personnel all deliver and especially the dispatchers who are always there to take our calls uh, when we need help. Anybody else have any comments on this? Okay, seeing none, then we will move on to our next uh, ceremonial item, which is recognizing Sean Mason, city attorney, with a commendatory resolution, which I did have up right here, and now I'm looking for it again. Um, Oh no, I have it over here. There we go. Okay. We, I would hope Sean could turn on his video. And I'm looking. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. It's, it's showing my video on. Let me turn it off. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> nice to see you all. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. We can, can hear you. We want to see your reaction when we say lots of nice things about you. Can, and can you see me? We can see you. Okay, great, great, great. And uh, do we need your video now or shall I go ahead and do some reading? A video? They didn't tell me it was going to be a video. Oh, it's you, the video. We got you. Very good. City of San Mateo resolution number C2-2021. Uh, Commending City Attorney Sean Mason, who has served the City of San Mateo from January 22nd, 2003, through what will be April 16th, 2021. Resolved by the City, by the Council of the City of San Mateo, California, that Sean Mason began his service at the Community of San Mateo at its, as its City Attorney on January 22nd, 2003, and has served with distinction in that role for over 18 years culminating in a career of over 37 years. And whereas, Sean brought 19 years of legal experience to his role in San Mateo, having served initially in the private sector, and within a year, he attained his lifelong dream of working as a city attorney's, at the city attorney's office in Thousand Oaks, California, for seven years, first as a deputy city attorney, then assistant city attorney, then as city attorney for the city of Benicia for four years, where he deviated back to private sector for one year stint, advising on land use issues, and then felt the calling back to municipal law where he became city attorney for Rancho Mirage, where he remained for five years until coming to San Mateo. And whereas, in addition to his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, cum laude from UCLA, he attained his Juris Doctor from Pepperdine University in 1984, also cum laude, he has been a leader in the city attorney's profession as a presenter, committee service with the executive committee with the League of California Cities, and was noted a noted expert on conflict of interest laws and regulations and became a go-to guy in the profession for all things related to Fair Political Practices Commission. And whereas, in his 18 years here, he has overseen and grown the city attorney's office into a high-functioning, well-respected, dedicated group of generalists and specialists practicing in all forms of municipal law where their mission to protect the city has been accomplished with great knowledge, skill, and especially adroit handling of complicated issues. And whereas Sean dealt with, wrote, devised, and advised on the law on issues supporting the city's policies on land use under the direction of 16 different city council members in the course of his tenure here including projects such as the continual redevelopment of the Bay Meadows racetrack into the enormous Bay Meadows development of mixed use housing, business and retail, multiple housing and affordable housing de developments to meet the increase in population of 15,000 in this time frame, large businesses, 
development such as Concar, Station Park, Green, and other specific plans and master plans to achieve the city's growth vision all while navigating complex multi-agency agreements to achieve these goals. And whereas, Sean worked as an intricate alphabet soup of election issues on an intricate alphabet soup of election issues from measures and initiatives on land use in measures P, Y, and R to ballot measures such as measures L, M, S, and W to housing affordability measure G to rent regulation initiative measure Q to charter amendments L, H, and B and wrote multiple impartial analysis and stayed up to date on ever-changing election law with deep gratitude from all of his city clerks. And whereas, he was responsible for many amendments to the municipal code, including writing law on campaign finance reform, sign regulations, private sewer lateral inspections, emergency eviction moratoria, safe gun storage, vaping, e-cigarettes, standard living conditions, substandard living conditions, outdoor dining regulations, and he has been instrumental in leading understanding of the very complicated legal aspects of the clean water program and is expert at melding state law into the local code to ensure the city was always operating with the right and proper lens. And whereas his role received, evaluated, and advised on all litigation issues, managing outside legal partners, as well as in-house efforts to respond to claims and lawsuits, as well as proactively advise on organizational issues, such as providing the advice for San Mateo Consolidated Fire to jump through all the hurdles and get up and running as a separate legal entity. And whereas, City Attorney Mason offered a distinguished presence at all city council meetings, where his soft-spoken style made everyone lean forward to ensure they did not miss a word of his expert legal advice and is fondly known as the law whisperer. Through the course of 792 meetings in which 249 ordinances were adopted, 2,313 resolutions passed, and copious amounts of contracts, agreements, and bid results were adopted in legal standing. And whereas he purports to be technologically challenged and profoundly held on to his flip phone well past when all his colleagues were on smartphones. And he would hold up his flip phone and say, see this, you can call people on it to the great amusement of his peers. He had an amazing way of reminding himself not to get too technical in our specific area by saying, I recognize those as words, but I have no understanding of what you are saying. Can you start over? <laughs> he reminded us to slow down, be thoughtful, read the code, be experts in our fields. He empowered us to know your stuff and be your own subject matter experts. And whereas he is approachable and calm, even when a mistake happens and staff nervously needs to talk something out with him, his signature sense of humor always began with, why are you going to jail? Just kidding. Tell me more. And he would roll up his sleeves and advise, uh, advise on a remedy and would follow up to make sure all was well. And whereas, with his wonderful wife of 37 years, Jane, son Patrick, and his daughter Erin, and their spouses, he is relocating to the great Northwest and will now have more time to hike, read, bicycle, take excursions, explore his new home, and follow sporting events while enjoying Portland's brewery scene. And whereas, Sean has been a stable influence for the city of San Mateo and the organization and can face retirement with the knowledge that he left a lasting legacy and that he can now do more risky things as he has lots of friends who will come bail him out. And now therefore, this council does hereby confer upon Sean M. Mason its highest commendation for the manner in which he has performed his service as a city attorney of San Mateo with special thanks for his endless availability, professionalism, dedication to the organization, and for his style, knowledge, and character. Adopted this fifth day of April, 2021, by the San Mateo City Council. Thank you, Sean. Awesome. There it is. It is. Words, Sean. Uh, words? Yes, please. No, 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 no. Sean doesn't get to speak yet. No. Oh, okay. Go, Joe. Okay, I'm jumping in. Um, Shauna, 
I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that you have meant everything to us. And I, I'm speaking on behalf of the entire city of San Mateo. The way that you have approached your job is always to be transparent with the general public and to serve the greater good for all residents. Um, you are the model of a modern city attorney and uh, you will be missed dearly. We, we cannot tell you enough what you meant to us because you didn't face just a easy few years. You, you have faced multiple decades of really challenging uh, experiences and, and I can't imagine anything uh, that a city attorney has, has had to face greater than what you have faced and I appreciate everything that you have done. And on top of all of that, I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that as a council member, you were always there to listen and to give guidance and counsel. It was always for the betterment of the city, uh, but I can't thank you enough. Your retirement is well-deserved. Uh, we all admire you. We all uh, wish you the best. Uh, and I love that you are going to sp be spending time with your kids um, and, and you deserve it. Uh, we've been through many of life's challenges together and I thank you dearly as a friend for everything that you've been to me personally. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, Joe. So, um, I'll go. Um, well, Sean, you were indeed a jack of all trades. And that was certainly called upon in this job. And the thing about you was not only you're a jack of all trades, but you always, always kept the integrity of the city at the forefront. Whether it was, didn't matter, whether it was a council member, a department head, uh, a resident of the city, at the forefront of your mind, every action was determined by the integrity of the city. We are indebted to you for your knowledge, for your leadership, and yes, for your friendship. You will be sorely missed. Um, it is indeed a well, well-deserved uh, retirement, but um, you filled this role, and it was a demanding role, uh, with the highest um, integrity and skill set. So we're enormously grateful as a city and as an individual I am as well. I wish you luck. Thank you, Diane. And I think I see whose hand is up now. Emma, go ahead. Sean, I, I want to let you know how grateful I am for the chance to work with you. Um, there are there are many people that have become teachers to me and um, and your lesson to me all along the way ever since I joined council was um, was really modeling what it means when we say the San Mateo way. Um, you, you've often used that term and you reference it and I feel like it, it's always been this foundational anchor in how you approach your work at, with the professionalism and and to borrow um, Diane's word, the integrity that that you approach everything with, and um, and I have seen you um, navigate some of the hardest conversations and decisions um, in a way that keeps us true to um, maintaining the public trust. And, um, and that is the San Mateo way, making sure that what we do is, um, is always in service to the public and protecting that relationship. And I, I just have been so, um, you know, just so humbled watching you in action and learning from you. And I'm so grateful for, for the time we've spent together. So you thank you. Uh, Sean, I want to thank you very much for your always open door policy, uh, your willingness to pick up the phone when I called you numerous times about different issues. Um, uh, always willing to uh, uh, listen to my alternatives and suggest your own alternatives. Um, and um, even though we didn't disagree on everything, I always found you to be a very likable fellow, somebody that I couldn't not like because of our disagreements. Um, uh, you uh, and I respect the fact that you had your convictions and your commitments, and uh, uh, you had the law 
which I didn't have, just a bunch of ideas. But um, somehow I think that in the city of San Mateo, we have, for the most part, done really well on, on, on really, by and, for, by and large, uh, the majority of issues that we have worked on. Um, and so I want to say that I really envy you of moving to Portland because I love Portland. Uh, Oregon in the summer is so unique and you will really enjoy uh, your experiences there. And um, uh, uh, you'll learn about the winter, but uh, you'll get there. <laughs> and, uh, um, but good luck in all of your ventures. Thank you very much. Thank and you. now your words. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for the, the kind and, and thoughtful words. They uh, do mean a lot to me. Um, and I've got a presentation I'm going to go through. It's probably going to be <laughs> much uh, longer than you would wish it would be. But 18 years is a long time. <laughs> I've got a lot of people to thank. And um, so let me just get on with it, right? So um, it was over three decades ago that I made the decision to start a career as a municipal lawyer. And a little over 18 years ago that I made the decision to come to San Mateo as its city attorney. And I've never regretted either decision. Um, for most places, 18 years is a long time for a city attorney or a city manager or high level city executive. The nature of the work we do and the environment in which we do that work typically leads to turnover at a much higher rate. But uh, there's something that's special about San Mateo. Uh, my predecessor, Roy Abrams, served for 17 years. Arnie Crosi, the first city manager I worked with here, retired after 18 years. Susan Loftus, Arnie's successor, served the city in high-level positions for over 25 years, including five as a city manager. And her successor, Larry Patterson, served the combined 18 years as public works director and then city manager. So in these parting remarks, I'd like to reflect on what makes San Mateo a special place that people want to work for for a long time. And then finish by thanking the many people who have made my 18 years as rewarding and enjoyable as they have been. Um, I, I promise they didn't pay ammo to prompt me with the San Mateo Way, but the San Mateo Way features uh, prominently in, in what I'm about to say. Uh, when I first started working with the city, I frequently heard the, the phrase, the San Mateo Way to describe the organization's approach of working through difficult challenges. The term was a shorthand way of describing a problem-solving or decision-making approach that emphasizes collaboration and the careful consideration of the various and sometimes competing interests of community stakeholders. The approach is respectful to the views of all participants and tends to lead to solutions that are built upon consensus as opposed to the imposition of one solution favored by a narrow majority. This approach differs from what one normally sees in government. What one typically sees is decision-making as a process where supporters of one position or another vigorously advocate for the wisdom of their position while disparaging the views or concerns of anyone who might disagree. In my experience, this is decisions made in this, in this way do more to divide communities than to build them. But San Mateo has been different. The San Mateo way is to go beyond the mere advocacy of positions. The approach looks to identify and understand the underlying interest of all those involved and to seek out solutions that accommodate to the interest of all to the maximum extent possible. This approach is more positive, more productive, and more likely to produce a sense of shared community among the diverse population that makes up the city. In my time with the city, the San Mateo Way has enabled the city to weather multiple economic downturns, including the Great Recession, to build broad community consensus in support of the transformative rail corridor plan and the Bay Meadows development and to undertake historic public works projects like the Clean Water Program. I believe that the San Mateo Way is what has made the city a, great, a place of great stability where great things can get done. And that is an environment where good people want to work for a long time. In the years to come, San Mateo faces new and significant challenges. 
These include managing the fiscal impacts of the coronavirus pandemic and a drafting of a new general plan in an increasingly polarized public square. While these challenges may threaten to divide the community, I'm confident that this council and future councils will successfully manage these challenges by approaching them in a San Mateo way. So let me now focus on the people and thank the people who have made this time so special. There are many, many people who have contributed in ways large and small to make my time with the city so rewarding. I'd first like to go back to the beginning to express my deep appreciation to the members of the city council that hired me and brought me to San Mateo. There were no glass ceilings in San Mateo at that time. The city was led by four smart, strong women, leaders each of whom continue to serve the community in their own ways. Jan Epstein, Supervisor Carol Groom, Sue Lampert, and Claire Mack. Rounding out the group was the former Marine, the late John Lee, who often referred to himself as the thorn among four roses. Thank you to Jan, Carol, Sue, and Claire. I'd also like to thank those who followed in service. Jack Matthews, Brant Brody, Fred Hansen, David Lim, Robert Ross, and Maureen Frescott. Each of these individuals provided many years of dedicated service to our community. And I'm grateful I had the opportunity to work with each of them. And of course, I'd like to thank each of you for stepping up to do your part in service to the city and its residents. It has been my pleasure and privilege to serve with you and to support you in your efforts to address the city's challenges and to identify and implement new opportunities to make constant improvement. The relationship between the city attorney and the city manager is crucial for a city's success. As the only two city employees directly hired by the council and responsible to, and accountable to the council, the positions play two distinctly different but important roles in supporting the council in their work. When the manager and the attorney understand and respect these complementary roles, the organization runs smoothly and efficiently to transform the council's vision for the community into reality. I have been truly blessed in this regard. When I arrived, Arnie Croce, a seasoned and well-respected public servant, was the city manager. Upon Arnie's retirement, the council appointed his long-term deputy, Susan Loftus, to lead the organization. Susan served the city in various capacities for many years and was instrumental in bringing the city through the Great Recession and placing the city's financial condition on a firm foundation moving forward. Upon Susan's retirement, the council appointed Larry Patterson to lead the organization, where Larry helped shepherd to near completion many of the significant infrastructure projects he was instrumental in initiating as the city's public work director. With each of these managers, I enjoyed a mutual respect and support that allowed us to work together well to advance the goals of the councils we served. And then came Drew. Before Drew became our excellent city manager, he was our excellent finance director. In that role, I found Drew to be intelligent, hardworking, honest, and ethical. Not surprisingly, nothing changed when Drew became city manager. Drew has always understood and supported the role of the city attorney's office and has been a pleasure to work with. But Drew has not only been a great colleague, Drew and I share a lot of interests outside of work, and through those interests, we have become good friends. I know that I will miss our time together. It has also been my pleasure to work with a distinguished group of department heads, many of whom have been recognized by their professional organizations for their talents and contributions. In the interest of time, I will not name every one, past and present, that I've worked with in terms of department heads. Working together, we have accomplished much over the years, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with them and the members of their staffs. I would also like to recognize and thank my staff. For the last 15 years, Assistant City Attorney Bahar Abdullahi and I have worked together in the City Attorney's Office. Bahar was the first attorney I had the opportunity to hire and I made a great choice. Over her time with the city, Bahar has grown into a trusted and capable legal advisor to the police department and the other departments to which she is assigned. 
13 years ago, I had the good fortune of hiring Gabrielle Whelan as assistant city attorney assigned to the community development department and the planning commission. When hired, Gabrielle was already an experienced municipal lawyer and our organization has benefited from her experience and dedicated service. Our office is small and we have shared so much of our time and so many life experiences. I appreciate their support over the years and I will miss Bahar and Gabrielle very much. Let me also take a moment to introduce and thank Ling Wang, our, new, our newest assistant city attorney. Ling joined us in February after serving seven years with the city of Oceanside. While Ling and I have not had an opportunity to work together that much, I'm confident he'll be a positive addition to the office. And I must also recognize and thank our support staff. I've been so lucky to have worked first with Nancy Fontana, then Karen Bertrand, and for the last year with Charlotte Pfeiffer as executive secretary to the city attorney. Like her two predecessors, Charlotte loves her work in, with, with our office and cheerfully continues in Nancy and Karen's tradition of excellent service. There are countless other employees, commissioners, board members, and community members to, home, to whom I owe a great deal. But in the interest of time, I'll move on. I will be sure to privately express my appreciation to these people, persons in the next couple of weeks. And finally, I'd like to recognize and thank my family. My wife and Jane and I have been together for 32 years, not quite 37. Somebody got added, added a few there. And over those years, she has patiently endured my absence from home during what must be thousands of commission and council meetings, special meetings and conferences. She's also never said no to our next new adventure and served as the family's logistics officer for our moves from Southern California to the Bay Area, back to Southern California, and back to the Bay Area when I joined San Mateo 18 years ago. I look forward to our next adventures and to the opportunity to share every Monday night with her. And to my kids, Patrick and Aaron, they too made multiple moves without complaint and quickly adjusted to whatever new community my career took us to. Over the years, they have been real troopers and have allowed me to take on the next new challenge. And I'm pretty sure they were happy we wound up in San Mateo as Patrick met his wife, Fiona, and Aaron met her husband, Zoltan, while all four were attending Hillsdale High School. I love you all. Thank you again to all of you who've made these last 18 years in this wonderful place so enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you, Rick. Um, it's been a, a great ride for you and uh, for us likewise. So um, there you go. Enjoy. Thank you. Okay, next. We we'll... love you, Sean. Congrats. <laughs> We'll be staying tuned for your blog. You yeah, we want to see the Portland blog. There you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So we need to move on to the consent calendar at this point. And Madam Clark. Motion to approve the consent calendar. <laughs> Sorry? Motion, Motion to approve. To... No, you got to hang on, Joe. Uh, we are going to now uh, ask Madam Clark to read the items 3 through 16. With pleasure, Mayor. I always like to read a lot of long items after you've got me all emotional. <laughs> so all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the council to be routine and will be enacted by one motion without discussion. If discussion is desired, that item may be, will be removed and may be removed and considered separately. Item number three, city council meeting minutes approval. Item number four, Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission Appointment Subcommittee recommendation. Item number five, ordinance introduction, amend municipal code char chapter, placing certain objects in the public right of way. Item number six, workers' compensation program, third party administration contract. Item seven, California Transportation Commission local streets and roads project list. Item eight, transit oriented development pedestrian access plan agreement. Item nine, 25th Avenue grade separation project license agreements. Item 10, 
Public Works Capital Improvement Projects Appropriation Adjustments, Item 11, 2020 to 21 Sanitary Sewer Root Foaming North Basin Agreement. Item 12, Downtown Opportunity Sites Environmental Remediation Agreement. Item 13, 385 Second Avenue Lease. Item 14, Independent Audit Services Agreement. Item 15, City Council Strategic Plan Adoption. And item 16, the ordinance adoption for accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling unit updates is being pulled from consent by Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, is there any member of the council who would like to pull another item from the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none. Then I ask, is there any member of the public who would like to pull any item from the consent calendar for a discussion? You need to raise your hand so we can recognize you. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I have no hands raised. Okay. In that case. I, I move that we make uh, the clerk read a whole bunch of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I move approval of the consent agenda. Uh, with the exception of the item that's been pulled. I'll item check 16. It. So we have a motion to approve all but item 16, which has been pulled for further discussion. And a second? Second. Uh, Diane Pappen, and, second. And a second. Madam Clerk, may we have a roll call vote? Yes. Councilmember Gothels? Yes. Councilmember Pappen? Yes. Councilmember Lee? Deputy Mayor Bonilla? Yes. Motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to start on item 16, which is an ordinance that we went through um, uh, at the last meeting, uh, which was uh, looking at heights and grade and um, roof heights and plate heights and everything else, I think was um, uh, kind of a, a difficult discussion. Uh, it was based on uh, changes that were brought to our attention by staff in the state ADU law. And um, uh, I have to say that I dissented at that time because I felt like approving these changes, uh, number one, were just not good, sound structural choices for people who may be wanting to build an ADU in San Mateo. Additionally, I also feel that it's given the explanation that was we should make these changes now based on changes to state law and then come back within the next two or three months uh, with uh, input from the public and that then we could revisit this. I felt like that was putting things backwards. Uh, in the past, our past practice seems like it has always been that we would, if we have uh, uh, changes in a law coming from the state that affects us, we would ask the public for their input on that because the state did allow us some discretion. For instance, when they measured the height of 16 feet, they measured that as at least 16 feet in height, uh, where the item that was brought to us by staff mentioned 16 feet as a maximum height. Um, and I feel like the public didn't really have his chance uh, to weigh in and as it, for us to now go ahead and enact an ordinance, seek public input, and then come back and discuss that input and try to make a decision uh, based on the state law um, is, is actually adding more work and uh, putting the public um, aside for some time and, you know, and, and letting us make a decision. And I think it's contrary to what Sean described as the San Mateo way, where we work from public consensus. I think we need to get that, that even if it's not consensus, we need that public input to help us make this decision. So therefore, um, I'd like to hear from other people, but my thoughts are, I would like to see this uh, uh, ordinance uh, set aside for now. Uh, I would like to see staff conduct the public input process, and then we come back to make an informed decision. And so I would like to see what other council members think. Thank you. We have a hand up from uh, Council Member Lee. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think that 
uh, some the points that uh, you raised, Deputy Mayor Bonilla, about the integrity of process and making sure that um, that we are giving the public as much opportunity to um, to weigh in on some of the the policy and design decisions bef to allow ourselves um, a, re a comprehensive update. Um, instead of making making some of those decisions without input and then and then seeking public input to you know that could potentially overhaul all you know and um, and change everything um, from scratch anyway. And I think that a lot of my understanding is that the the timeline, you know when this came to us over a year ago last March, um, there there was this, um, this impetus to bring our codes into compliance with the state. And I think that um, when it was presented to us um, at our last session, that there was um, this sense of urgency to bring ourselves into compliance. For me, that wasn't actually contextualized with the, the fact that we've been out of compliance for over a year and, um, and that the, the difference between a couple more months to gather community input um, versus doing a two-step process and making decisions and then bringing that back to the community and then making more decisions um, is actually in some ways more onerous and, um, and out of sync with, with our, our standard practice. Um, and so, you know, and I actually have received some um, some public comment uh, to this effect. Uh, you know, a very active community member, uh, Ms. Lisa Diaz Nash, she wrote an email to me saying that she was very disappointed that the council had voted to go ahead with the changes before engaging in a robust community outreach process like Redwood City had. And it's, you know, I, I think it's really important when we're receiving community input about a failure of community community process that we take a step back and that we pause and um and and realize that what's been driving this um this this agenda to bring ourselves into compliance is actually um a very uh sort of arbitrary deadline that we've set for ourselves given the fact that that we've been living out of compliance for over a year thank you very much council member Lee. any other comments Sure. A um, couple of quick things. Number one, I want to um, just commend our city clerk. I want to make sure that we're acknowledging that we have closed captioning in this meeting, which is fantastic for accessibility to our meetings. Uh, I haven't noticed it before, uh, but it's fantastic, and I, I want to say thank you for that. As far as the item that we're addressing at this moment, um, I understand that we are trying to support, as a council, we're trying to support ADUs as one way to address the shortage in housing. And we're trying to do it in a way that recognizes and uh, celebrates a diversity of opinion across the city. Some people feel that ADUs should be regulated in a certain way and other people are more open to it. I think that our ordinance that we contemplated, the one that is on the consent agenda today, contemplates supporting ADUs in general. And I think that we are in the midst of a process that will support ADUs in the long term and, and determine what opinions across the, the city spectrum are supported for ADUs. So I, I think that we should continue with that process. Um, in the meantime, I still I still support the short term um, uh, regulation, the the ordinance that we had contemplated previously. So I, I welcome the conversation. I think we should continue talking. I I want there to be ADUs, so I'm supportive in general, but I'm open to uh, this ordinance in the short term while we're having that conversation. Council Member. Kevin. So um, I'm certainly relieved to, to see the embracing of community input, because as I said last time, that's what we had promised the community we would do. I do have some questions from our city attorney about where this would leave us. I had understood that an interim ordinance was 
there was a need for it. So I, I want to elaborate a little bit on that um, so that we know where we would be um, if we continued to be out of compliance, what that means. Yeah, so there um, are a couple of issues associated with that question, but uh, I, I think the, con the concern that staff had and uh, that motivated staff to come forward in this two-step process was that there was um, a risk that ADUs that had certain features uh, applications for those could come in during this period, the, the public outreach period. And because of the state law, we would not be able to, to deny the applications. And so the particular features that were of concern um, were uh, probably the one of the most significant, of, of, of the most significant concern was, was height. We spoke a lot of at our last meeting about height limits and how they and how they work, and um, in in San Mateo, basically, in the absence of establishing a six foot height limit, uh, the way it would work in San Mateo, if someone came in and applied for an application for an ADU, is you would go you revert to what the height limit is in the on the property under its current zoning, and there are properties in San Mateo that are, that have been developed uh, as single family homes, even if they are zoned for higher density, multiple family housing. And in those cases, a single family home could in theory come in and, and you would apply the zoning height limit. It could be 35 feet, it could be higher. And so in theory, someone could come in and, and apply for an ADU that is very high um, and in, in relationship to what exists on the site of a single family home and per, perhaps in relationship to, to neighboring properties. And the city would be in a position of having to approve that. Um, there, 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 was an, there was another concern about the, the, um, the proposed ordinance has an architectural standard in it that um, would would prohibit placing the entry into the ADU in such a way that's visible for the front. The concern is you don't want to have multiple um, entries to the building from the front of, uh, of the property, making it look like a, a multiple um, housing unit as opposed to a single family home. And so there's a, a, an architectural standard that the entry not, not be visible. And so during this time period of outreach, an applicant, if this ordinance is not adopted, an applicant could submit an application that has the entry facing the front and we would not be able to deny that application because that's part of the ordinance. And so there, there are those little features, um, height being probably more significant feature that theoretically, and it's you know theory, uh, one would wonder about would someone actually apply for a 35 foot uh, ADU? What would that look like? It would probably look kind of ridiculous. And then whether we'd actually see such an application, but there is that legal theory that the that legal threat that then risk that somebody could, and then we wouldn't be able to say no. And so I think that that concern for those types of issues is what you know, motivated staff to say, Hey, let's close these loopholes or concern areas concerned while we take a more comprehensive look at what to do with ADUs going forward. Uh, thank you, Sean. Diane, anything else? No, I mean, that's, that's what I had remembered is that if we were going to do anything, allow for anything greater than the 16 feet that the current state law had imposed in January of 2020, we were gonna go to the public. And so that's not what happened last time. And so, but there was this concern if it's just the minimum of 16 feet that stays on the books, as our city attorney described, and we didn't have any other, um, you know, restriction in place, it could be whatever you said, 32 feet or something. So that was what we promised the public we were going to do, as I understood it. And that's why I brought it up last time. 
Mr. Deputy Mayor, if there's no public comment, I'd like to call the question. I'd actually like to seek public comment. Do we have any public comment, Matthew? I have one hand raised. Um, Ryan Multashemi. Wait, can I ask a can I ask some clarifying questions to the um Sean before we get to that? Okay, go ahead. Questions okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Hold on, Ryan. <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to make sure, for the record, um, that that the the potential uh, of this uh, these kinds of applications um, being approved ha ha in the year that this um, the the law was passed and we've been out of compliance. Has there been any um, application of concern? Yeah, I believe we have um, planning staff uh, on the on the call, and, and they they would be able to answer that question. Uh, yes, uh, Council Member Lee. So um, we, I don't believe we've had any formal request for uh, you know abnormally large or tall H D uh, A D U. However, we've had I I personally had inquiries. Uh, from the public regarding building height, ADU building height within multifamily zoning districts such as the R3. And I think that's sort of a product of the fact that this new state laws have sort of brought to light this, this sort of, um, um, this loophole um, in terms of the uh, building height. And so uh, it's not something that's, uh, I, I think, the public is generally aware of. And so it was something that uh, staff feels that we needed to close. Okay. I would just build on that a, a little bit as well. Um, so I don't think that we have seen any um, super exaggerated types of, of building proposals that would make us alarmed in terms of this, this phase one approach. But we did also some hear some concern just about um, the integrity of our ordinance in comparison to the state law. And we were also trying to um, respond to concerns about that and about some provisions in the code. And so I will say that that was um, something that spurred us to move a little bit faster, um, recognizing that we had paused and that we weren't in line with the state requirements. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I watched, I replayed the, the um, our meeting from last March and it, what what I recall and what was in the meeting minutes is that you know we were unanimous in supporting the staff's recommendation to develop ADU building height maximums and objective standards compliant with state uh, requirements to help mitigate potential view shade privacy impacts on neighboring properties and completely in consensus about supporting a public input process. Right. So there was no um, at that time, there was no proposal to do a two phased approach. And what we're talking about is, um, you know, is mitigating a, an, a risk that has been in existence for over a year. Right. Which I think you can arguably no, say is very minimal and um, a, and extending out a timeline of a matter of months to get community input. And, um, and furthermore, some of the, the specific design components that were raised by staff, is it accurate to say that those design components, for example, like the front facing door, haven't actually gone through a community input process? So we hadn't done any of the community input process at this point. So when we, when we came to you in March, um, we heard our marching orders to do outreach loud and clear, but then we hit the pandemic and we shifted um, what we were working on in terms of how we were doing outreach. And so we were getting to the point in January where we were talking about reinitiating that and recommencing that outreach. And we heard some concern about um, the status of our ordinance. And so we recognized that the outreach might take some time and that we wanted to be patient with it. And then we wanted to make sure that we were thorough and thoughtful about it. And so in the spirit of that, we thought, well, let's not rush the outreach. Let's do something quick to try to just get in line with the state so that we're not um, reinterpreting the state code and not having it written somewhere where applicants don't have that easy access to it. Because in the intervening time, while we haven't had, say, any 
you know, four story detached ADUs proposed, um, we have had a lot of confusion about what our ADU regulations are and about how they relate to the state code and what the state allows versus what the city allows. And so it has caused some confusion in that way. And even as we update things like our handouts and our submittal requirements, there are folks who look at the HCD handbook and who look at the state code. And so I think we were also, we were trying to get in line, but also make things easier to understand for our customers and for our staff who apply the regulations and who need to understand them. And so um, we wanted to do a more thoughtful and comprehensive outreach process um, where we could consider everything and take some time, but still recognizing that we heard there was a risk of leaving things the way we are or the way they are for the time being. So that's what we were trying to respond to. And remind me again, what is the timeline for the outreach and when this would come back to council? Uh, we were planning to bring it back later this summer. And so um, we think the outreach component itself, we can probably wrap up in about two months and then we have the drafting which would also be taking place somewhat concurrently, but we'd have to get to a certain point where we've heard things before we can really start the drafting and figuring out what um, we think needs to be proposed in the draft. And so there would be the timeline with that, the study session, planning commission, city council. And I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm accurate with the timeline. At how long, how many months have we been out of compliance? Over a year, a year in January, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And uh, Diane, do we need clarification now before we go to public comment? I can't hear you, Diane. Muted. Forgive me. Uh, what we decided last March was anything that went higher than the 16 feet, we would do public outreach for. Christina, is that correct? Should, uh, the, the, the question as posed in the staff report was, should the city refer to the state statute for maximum building height of 16 feet or study alternative building height restrictions or other objective standards? And we all on the tape said we would study it if we went higher than 16 feet and everybody was in agreement. And we so, would do the public outreach and we're all in agreement on the public outreach. That's why I was so concerned last time is because we went higher than what we said we would do without outreach. And that was the big concern. I mean, we all want to see ADUs help us with our housing crisis. That's not the issue. The issue is what did we say to the public? And we said to the public, if we go higher than what the state maximum is, we will do the necessary outreach. If we don't do that now, then there's that downside that our city attorney described. But I'm so, so that's kind of what we're confronted with. Right. And I yeah. called the question. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to add that the state did not establish a maximum in fact, in their language, which I'm looking at, because I asked the staff to refer me to it. You're right, what you're it right. What calls for is at least 16 feet in height with four you're foot right. side and rear setbacks. It says you're at correct. least, which is different from maximum. Quite you're, right. A bit, you're right. right, you're right, you're right. So, so we had decided you. that if we did anything beyond right. their minimum, we would go out and do public outreach. I stand right. corrected. And, and it is my understanding that staff has already been using some discretion uh, and if uh, uh, I think a um, uh, applicant seeks to, to uh, go beyond uh, what we're talking about here that the state law is in place and the state law itself doesn't administer any maximum heights here. It simply says at least. We have existing height regulations in our neighborhoods, right? And those have been what we've been using. Um, uh, so, like I say, once again, um, the, the, the process of receiving input and coming back to us was posited as something that would be a few months, right? Um, so, I just don't see, uh, like, I feel like if I, if I remember the public trying to build an ADU and I saw people trying to, to close regulations in on me and, and impose uh, uh, somehow that I have to build within a constricted roof space on top of my garage or uh, the second floor of any ADU I built would have to require some kind of special construction within a roof space rather than having a fully usable room with eight, seven or eight foot ceilings uh, uh, is, is restrictive without actually having had that discussion. We are- Approval of this consent agenda item. 
We are currently within what the state allows. Okay, let, let's go to the public comment. Thank you. Okay, one moment, please. Um, our first speaker is Rayon Matashemi. Please unmute yourself. Uh, I, I'm ready to give public comment, but I noticed that Council Member Lee had questions, and I just wanted to make sure that all questions were asked of the Council before um, I made the comment. Okay. Okay, so in that case, I'll, I'll continue. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so I I was um, not not thinking that this item would come up for public comment today, but I'm glad it did because I felt like at the previous city council meeting there was a lot of discussion on this item specifically, and there was no clear consensus on the way to move forward, which is why I was surprised that um, the a restriction was adopted um, before public outreach had commenced. Um, I think that removing uh, at that tabling this ordinance is not does not go against us saying that we will do public outreach if we want to go beyond 16 feet i don't think that removing uh, that that tabling this ordinance until the public outreach is completed does that in fact i think that what that does is it allows for a robust public outreach process to happen before a restriction is implemented that would limit the ability of San Mateo residents to build housing in areas that, um, and keep in mind that this is for areas, that this is a quote unquote loophole that allows for more housing to be built in areas where height limits already allow for um, greater than 16 feet. So that's why, that's why I was concerned that an undue restriction is being imposed prior to public outreach and I would not be in support of this ordinance um, going forward. I think that also there are other things that have not been considered by the council, regardless of heights. For example, design standards that were brought up in public comment in the previous meeting that would potentially make it more expensive to build ADUs. All of this is being, is occurring. Uh, these restrictions are being adopted without public outreach. And I think that that is wrong. And it is an the antithesis to the way that we, um, that we say we would like to go forward with with public outreach. Um, I don't think we should be making it harder to build ADUs, especially prior uh, to public outreach. So um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Motoshami. Um, okay, I think uh, if we have closing comments or a motion. Uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor, we have more public comment. I have oh, three additional you. speakers. Okay. Yeah. So next speaker is Jordan Grimes. Yes, good evening, Council, Honorable Mayor. Oh, I guess Honorable Mayor is not with us tonight, excuse me. Um, I just want to second uh, Deputy Mayor Bonilla's uh, points and suggest that the Council consider waiting um, at, at least until September um, at the end of the state legislative session to move forward on this. As I mentioned um, you know, in the last round of this, AB 916 by Assemblymember Salas um, is continuing to move forward in the legislature and AB 916 would raise the state minimum height uh, for ADUs to 20 feet. So it's very likely we'll be back here in late summer or early fall anyway. And based on the timeline described by staff, if we're to embark on this community engagement process and the community were to decide on keeping the 16 foot limit or maybe you know moving it a foot or two higher, um, you know, there, there is a good chance that the state could uh, and indeed likely will immediately override that via AB 916, and we'd wind up wasting a whole lot of staff and community time, as well as creating some serious confusion within the community um, if, if things were to change uh, pretty drastically. So that's something that I think, um, you know, staff and council might want to consider. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next speaker is Lisa Diaz-Nash. Thank you, council. And I would like to thank Deputy Mayor Bonilla, Council Member Lee, Council Member Pappen for being interested in opening this up again to public, to community input. And what I think is wonderful about this is that we have heard people who have very different opinions about what the height identity or limit should be, who are all arguing for extending community input. So I think it's very important to have the community input first if there are any liabilities we have to deal with, 
That is what we have city staff and our city attorney for. But let's do the community input, have a robust discussion of many different views, and then come back when we have a much more uh, deep and robust understanding of what the community wants against what state legislation is, against what we want in our general plan. So I would definitely uh, encourage you to table us tonight and ask for more community input now in a very you know, speedy way, but robust way. So thank you, everyone. Next speaker is Seema Patel. Good evening, council members, Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I wanna note that I am a community relations commissioner, but I am speaking tonight on um, as a private citizen and a resident of the central neighborhood. It, it seems to me like we're weighing two risks here. Um, one is the risk that someone might come in and submit a permit for a tall ADU that is still within the height limits of their zone, um, which has not happened, it sounds like, in the last 15 months that we've been out of compliance, versus the risk that people who have a project currently in uh, play may delay that project to wait and see what happens after the community input if, if restrictions are enabled now. Um, I know at least one person who's in the second scenario, which is myself, my garage is taller than eight feet. So if this restriction were to go in place now, I would have to put my ADU project on hold and, and wait and see how things came out with the community input. So I just wanna echo the previous comments and request that we don't enact any restrictions now. We, we keep things open because it seems like the risk of an extra tall permit request coming in is pretty low. And um, we wait to get the full community input and hear about additional edge cases like garages being taller than eight feet. Um, I was talking to some neighbors. I heard people mention that their neighbors in their block all have ADUs that are up against the property line. And so if they were to build theirs in a setback, they would be the one that looks odd. I think there's probably a whole bunch of different edge cases that we don't know about yet that we should get the community input first before we figure out what restrictions to put in place. Thank you very much. And I have no other speakers, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much. Okay, then I bring it back to the council for any further uh, comments or a motion. I think we have Mr. Brennan has his hand raised. Oh, thank you. Mr. Brennan, please go ahead. Sure. Um, I just wanted to make note uh, with regard to some of the comments uh, from the public and the council. Um, the, the staff's proposed approach was entirely driven um, by the notion of performing community outreach. Um, we do have current our current existing ordinance in place uh, does defer to the underlying zoning district for building height but it should be noted that uh, our existing ordinance did not contemplate adus of up to 1200 square feet it only contemplated adus of a maximum 640 square feet uh, nor did it uh, consider uh, reduced setbacks or adu uh, uh, permissive ADU locations uh, that are now allowed under state law. So those are some of the considerations staff looked at in terms of developing uh, this proposed ordinance. Um, so I just wanted to make note of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Brennan. So back to the council. Further discussion, a motion. Well, one of the things we might wanna look at is first of all again i want to go on the record that i am really embracing this idea of public output because i really had a lot of concern last time that we were getting out ahead of our skis beyond what we promised the public would do so i, I welcome everybody into the fold on that and there were a lot of people here last time that wanted certain things and i was i'd received i'd been on the campaign trail most recently council member lee had been on the campaign trail most recently and we'd certainly heard differing point of views than what was all teed up last time so i i'm relieved that we want to do some public output i'm a little relieved that we're going to hang out longer i'm a little concerned excuse me that we may hang out longer without updating our um our our ordinance um is it possible 
that we could shorten the length of time to do the outreach. And then that way we don't continue on. Uh, one of our speakers suggested that she's waiting to hear what we ultimately decide and, and we'll adjust her ADU plans accordingly. So is it possible that we could shorten this outreach time, bring it back to us um, you know, with more um, haste and, um, and uh, revise our ordinance accordingly? Um, we can certainly go back and look at our schedule and see if there's ways we can maximize um, some of the efficiencies of our events. Um, and maybe we can be doing some things more concurrently. Um, as I mentioned, I think we need to, to take some amount of time to just make sure that everyone has a chance um, to participate, but also, you know, to think about it, to, to hear what we have to say and what we're all talking about and to go home and look at it in their neighborhoods and to think about what it means and as they move through town. And so that does take, you know, some time to do, but I think there probably are ways where we can um, make it happen before the end of the summer. I don't know how soon, um, but we can definitely look at ways where we can condense our schedule and try to do some things um, concurrently. So there's the possibility of doing that or council member Gothel has called for the question on this uh, idea of uh, 16 feet and then eight feet more to the ridge line. So that's kind of where we are at this moment in time. Do you still want to call for the question? Where are you, Council Member well, Bogle? To your point, pardon? Diane, um, Lisa Diaz Nash was on the campaign trail most recently as well, uh, listening to members of the public from across the city. And her opinion tonight was that we table this until we have more input. And I, I'm, I'm open to that. I'm leaning towards that at this point based on her comments. Okay. So perhaps, it is, perhaps it is we do this with a, a shorter time frame. I know our, our community development director is, is doing the best she can to work with us here, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, I, I think certain. we're already asking CDD to, to do this as quickly as possible. So whatever time frame that is, is fine. Um, I I withdraw my motion. Okay. So then we will not have this item approved on our consent calendar with no. instructions to staff to try to expedite the public input process so that we don't continue on even longer um, without some sort of compliance with the state law and, and all that other good stuff. I concur with that. Yep. We welcome the public input. Let's go for it. Great. Good. In that case, we shall now move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, first, first we haven't done uh, public comment. We need to do public comment for items that are not on tonight's agenda. And so I have a little blurb here on that. Next on the agenda is public comment. Members of the public wishing to comment on any item not appearing on the agenda may address the city council at this time. State law prevents the council from taking action on any matter not on the agenda. Your comments may be referred to staff for follow-up. Public comment is limited to a total of 15 minutes. However, an opportunity for additional public comment may be uh, provided later in tonight's agenda. Public comment, Madam Clerk. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I have one public comment. Again, it is uh, Rayan Motashemi. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Motashemi. I am just providing public comment because I've noticed um, on Nextdoor, I've seen several posts regarding cyclist um, accident, or not accidents, they're actually crashes because um, I want to make sure I'm using language that indicates that uh, crashes involving cyclists can be prevented with the appropriate infrastructure in place. And I've noticed that there's, um, in general, we've seen an uptick in uh, speeding and other activities uh, like that are dangerous um, from drivers in, in context of cyclists and pedestrians on the roadway. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, some years ago, the city council adopted a vision zero policy, which I am very supportive of and would just like to um, uh, bring up that that policy is um, something that I see that is uh, that it is supported by the city 
that that was adopted by the city council, which indicates that it had support and would hope that Vision Zero continues to have uh, the support of the council going forward, which is to eliminate all traffic deaths um, and reduce traffic um, like crashes involving cars and pedestrians and cyclists to encourage active transportation in our city. So this was just a general public comment regarding that. I think any crashes involving um, cyclists are and pedestrians and is, um, is something that's bad for our city. And I would certainly hope that we could do everything in our power to reduce and eliminate them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I have no other speakers. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. And then we shall move on. Public hearing, item 17, which is unpaid sidewalk repair charges for service and proposed property tax liens. I believe we have a presentation from staff. Yes, thank you. Just one moment, please, while I get my presentation up. Okay, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. My name is Valerie Vigil, and I am a Management Analyst in the Public Works Department. Today, I will be briefly presenting on the proposed property tax liens for unpaid sidewalk repair charges. The purpose of the sidewalk repair program is to make the sidewalk accessible and safe for all users. The city follows municipal code for sidewalk maintenance, which states that the property owner has the primary duty to fund and perform repairs to sidewalk fronting their properties. If they fail to perform or fund the repairs, then the municipal code allows for unpaid sidewalk repair charges to be collected by the county collector as a special assessment tax. Sidewalk repairs caused by tree root damage are either paid in full by the owner or split 50-50 with the city, depending if the tree is on private property or in the public right of way. The sidewalk repair program has typically used $200,000 per year funded by the general fund. As a general overview, the sidewalk repair program incorporates safe travel, adding and or maintaining value to individual properties, and ultimately decreasing homeowner liability by proactively encouraging maintained sidewalks in front of individual residences. The program started with a pilot project in 2009 and was formally initiated in 2010. In past years, designated neighborhoods were inspected by the Public Works Department and potential hazards were identified with a, displace, with a displacement criteria equal to or greater than three quarters of an inch. When a sidewalk project begins, the, re the residents are notified of the upcoming project. The project is then scoped, designed, and competitively bid and awarded to the lowest cost qualified bidder. This allows us to get better pricing and savings for both the residents and the city in comparison to doing a case-by-case -case project. Once bid, the residents are notified of estimated costs and they are given the option to either perform the work themselves or join the program to take advantage of the cost savings. Upon completion, the residents who opted into the program or did not perform the work on their own are sent an invoice for their cost share. This year, we are focusing on cleaning up outstanding invoices related to sidewalk repair programs from 2013 to 2019. Once repairs are completed, an invoice is sent and payable within 60 days. If not paid, the debt becomes delinquent and homeowners are sent a letter stating a lien will be placed on the property. The combined tax liens for the four projects affected equal $13,104 in outstanding unpaid charges. The final list of unpaid charges will be submitted to the County Collector Office to be placed on the upcoming tax roll. The recommendation is to adopt a resolution to approve the list of, of, of properties with unpaid sidewalk repair costs 
and to direct staff to forward the list to the county controller's office for collection of these unpaid sidewalks repair costs on the property tax roll. That concludes my presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the council? Took the words out of my mouth, thank you. <laughs> Great presentation. Let me bring it back to the council for questions. Thank you. I have one question. Yes, it's please. killing me. What happened to 2018? <laughs> you had nothing for 2018. There were some years that were skipped, uh, either because we did not have the staff to be able to lead the project, but that is true. We did not have a project in 2018. We had one in 2017 and 2019. Okay. I have nothing further. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, then we'll go to public comment. Madam, Madam Clerk, do we have public comment? Mr. Deputy Mayor, I have no hands raised. Okay, seeing uh, oh. no public comment. Oh. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve and a second. Madam Clerk, can we have a roll call vote? Aye. Yes. 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 Council Member Kotel, you guys, I'm sorry, I was muted. Council Member Lee, I heard yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we move on to item 18, which tonight is COVID 19 update. We have the uh, city manager, Drew Corbett, Mr. Drew Corbett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Benia and members of council. Just a brief update for you tonight. Um, starting off with uh, the health and vaccine update. So as you're aware, the county has been in the orange tier for about three weeks now. Uh, numbers continue to look good uh, with respect to cases and positivity rates. So hopefully that will put us into the yellow before too long. Uh, vaccine eligibility has expanded. So last Thursday, anyone over 50 years old became eligible. And then in about 10 days on April 15th, anyone over 16 years old uh, becomes eligible. The county over the past couple of weeks has held two community vaccine clinics in San Mateo. Um, over a thousand uh, shots have been administered to our eligible at-risk residents, which is great. And the Bay Area Community Health Advisory Council has also done some targeted vaccine events for our vulnerable populations. So I wanted to circle back on the restaurant, brewery, and winery relief program. So as you may remember, uh, last month, the city contributed $300,000 to the program. The county added another $220,000 for San Mateo businesses. So all, all told, there were nearly 180 uh, total applicants from San Mateo. 131 of those applicants were deemed eligible. So based on the existing funded uh, funding, we were able to award 52 grants and those were awarded on a lottery basis, not on a first come first serve basis. So that did leave 79 eligible businesses that did not get funding. The program remains open. And if there are future contributions, whether they be from the city, from uh, private entities, from foundations, um, the, the program does remain open and, and those can uh, those contributions can fund the remaining need if, if those funds uh, come to fruition. Uh, operationally, uh, we have been able to consolidate the LEAP program at the King Center uh, starting next week. Um, it'll serve 72 students, so we're able to free back up the Senior Center. Uh, we do expect, uh, even with the schools starting to, to return to in-person learning, that uh, there will be a continued need for this program for the remainder of the school year at an estimated cost of about $114,000. Um, as things are opening up, we're starting to see uh, the recreation oper operation get to open up a little bit. So later this week, um, they'll start accepting small group uh, picnic reservations. And starting this morning, uh, summer activity registration began. Uh, that includes our children's camps and small group swim lessons. Uh, library, the lobbies opened at the main and the, and the branch libraries last Monday, and we are still on track, um, if things go well, to um, open up the facilities in a limited capacity in four weeks. And finally, from the city manager's office, the business recovery task force is in the process of being formed, and we have our first meeting scheduled two weeks from now. 
And finally, for council confirmation for actions taken in response to the emergency proclamation, I'd like to get confirmation of the continued funding of the LEAP program for the remainder of the school year, as well as uh, the continued waiver of business tax penalties and interests for certificates that expired uh, at the end of March of 2021. And just for context, we have been waiving penalties and interest on the business tax certificate um, uh, for about a year now since the beginning of the pandemic. And so that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very one much. Quick, Go ahead. One, one quick question. How much were those business grants? Were uh, they, they an equal amount? Yeah, they situation? were 10,000 a piece. Oh, I can do that math. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other council members questions? I just want to say um, that I just enrolled my kids in camp mm -hmm. and um, and they continue to be so happy at the LEAP program. We are doing really good work. And um, and uh, Councilwoman Pappen and I are both liaisons to um, the school district and they continue to um, to be in incredibly grateful for, um, for the program and the support to our students. So um, it's a great partnership. Thank you, Thank Councilwoman you. Lee. Councilmember Goldfels, anything? Nope. Okay, let's move on to public comment on this item. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we have one speaker, yep. uh, Felicia Diaz Nash. Thank you. Good evening again, Council. Um, City Manager Corbett, I'd be interested in who is on the Business Recovery Task Force. Thank you. Very good. No other public commenters, Madam Clerk? No. Okay. Okay, then uh, we need to offer a confirmation to the city manager for his work uh, as requested. Do we have any member offering that confirmation? So moved. Okay, it's moved. Second? Second. Okay, okay. Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. Um... Councilmember Gothos? Yes. Councilmember Lee? Yes. Councilmember Pappen? Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla? Yes. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. City Manager Drew Corbett. Thank you very much for good work. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Would you would you care for me to answer the, the question that came up from, oh, from please the member do. of the public? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, the task force is in the process of being formed. Um, it is not necessarily going to have a set membership. We're partnering with the chamber, uh, Sam Cita, DSMA, uh, Nova Workforce um, to, to bring interested parties together. And again, that may be, may be flexible membership, will be flexible membership um, with, with the intent of having a task force that really um, coordinates efforts and makes sure that, that uh, that no one is, um, that we're not duplicating efforts and that we're all sort of working towards the same goal, which is to help help our business. So I don't have a precise answer for you right now, but hopefully that helps frame the, the context of the tax task force. It has only people. I don't like that task force. <clears throat> don't check that out. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. It sounds like we've done everything we need to do on this item. Next is item 19, proposed fireworks amendments, ordinance introduction. I think that's the end of that. <clears throat> so we have Lieutenant Earnshaw. Second. I'm good. Confirm you can, confirming you can see my screen. Okay. Uh, good evening, Deputy Mayor and Council Members. My name is Matthew Earnshaw, and I'm a police lieutenant with the San Mateo Police Department in our field operations. Tonight, I will be giving a presentation on illegal fireworks activity and enforcement efforts in San Mateo. I will also provide feedback on the use of acoustic detection technology as a possible tool to identify where illegal fireworks are being used. Finally, our staff worked with the City Attorney's Office to create an ordinance we would like to introduce to the San Mateo Municipal Code as Chapter 10.20 titled Fireworks, which relates to the enforcement of firework violations. Uh, this presentation will consist of a background, our current regulations, an overview of the illegal firework activity, 
uh, during the past three years. I will pro propose the ordinance and discuss our outreach and enforcement plan. I will provide an analysis of the acoustic detection technology. And finally, we are requesting feedback and actions from you, and then I will open it up to questions. The use of illegal fireworks in San Mateo has been an issue over the last several years. Efforts to effect effectively address the activity are difficult for many reasons, including staffing levels, limited enforcement options, inability to identify the actual user or possessor of fireworks, particularly in large group settings, and lack of clarity on allowable action to be taken by the police department with respect to seizing fireworks. Last year was an exceptional year for fireworks, likely due to the COVID-19 pandemic and civil unrest across the country. During the two weeks leading up to and including July 4th, there were 294 fireworks related incidents logged into our police department's computer aided dispatch system. This is compared to 109 in 2019 and 175 in 2018 during the same time frame. The police department responds to these calls for service. However, an officer must actually witness the firework being set off in order to cite an individual for use or possession of fireworks. Due to the language in the fire code regarding authority to seize fireworks, police officers have limited, have been limited in their ability to seize fireworks without the presence of a fire marshal or designated staff. All fireworks, including small firework devices containing restricted amounts of pyrotechnic composition, commonly referred to as safe and sane fireworks are not allowed in San Mateo. The sale, storage, possession, and use of fireworks is prohibited by the California Fire Code, which is adopted by the city via chapter 23.28.010 of the San Mateo Municipal Code. However, the fire code specifically grants authority to cease fireworks to the fire chief. Prior to the Independence Day holiday this year, staff recommends introduction of an ordinance adding a new chapter to the San Mateo Municipal Code to clearly indicate that the police department is authorized to seize any fireworks as well as issue a citation. We understand proposed ordinances such as this usually require a study session, but because this proposed ordinance is straightforward, we are bringing this to you for, for adoption. A violation of this ordinance would result in an infraction with, sign, with fines are as set in San Mateo Municipal Code Chapter 1.04.010 at $100 for the first conviction, 200 for a second conviction within one year, and $500 for each additional conviction within one year. Depending on the magnitude or frequency of the violation, offenders could be charged with a misdemeanor, which carries a fine of about two, up to $1,000 in potential imprisonment. Large quantities of dangerous fireworks can also be charged as a felony. Staff recommends the city and police department begin an aggressive annual public awareness campaign through its social media platforms, highlighting the city's zero tolerance policy for firework usage and possession. Staff also recommends providing special patrol details to provide selective enforcement. It will still be difficult to catch violators in the act, so educational efforts will be ongoing. After receiving numerous complaints related to illegal fireworks last year, the police department was asked to investigate the use of acoustic detection technology to curtail the use of fireworks in the city. This technology is used locally in Redwood City and East Palo Alto and in other Bay Area counties. This technology uses sound sensors to locate gunshots in a community, improve response time, determine how many shooters are in an area, and identify the types of firearms being used. The technology is not intended to investigate illegal fireworks. Smaller, safe and sane fireworks would likely not even register. However, it is possible that the data and information derived from such technology could be used to identify hotspots for fireworks use. The acoustic detection technology company we worked with is ShotSpotter. The system is triggered by loud noises, which could include gunshots, fireworks, helicopters, construction sounds, or thunder. Once the system registers a sound, an algorithm 
classifies it as a potential gunshot or not. Sensors are installed on light poles, rooftops, or buildings, and are intended to register an acoustic impulse within a square mile. When the sensors pick up on an impulse, the sound is recorded at slightly different times based on how far the sensor is from the source. ShotSpotter has a 98% accuracy rate and will notify the police department within 32 seconds. The technology is intended to identify and locate gunshots because a fired ground is considered a linear movement and easy to triangulate in the system. A firework is considered spatial because once it detonates, the firework can continue in several different directions, making it difficult for the system to triangulate its origin. ShotSpotter charges $70,000 per square mile per year, and there's a one-time $20,000 startup fee. The city of San Mateo is 15.85 square miles. ShotSpotter used some data provided by staff and plotted three areas in the city with the majority of gun violence and fireworks incidents in the last year. The combined total of these three areas was 2.33 square miles. Staff concluded ShotSpotter is an exceptional product for cities with high volume gun violence. The current conditions in San Mateo may not be cost prohibitive since the technology is not made for firework detection and the number of calls we handle for gun violence may not be worth the investment. Staff requests council feedback and action on the following. Affirm that the City Council does wish for the Police Department to respond to and enforce calls for service related to illegal fireworks. Provide direction on whether to pursue the use of audio enforcement technology. And three, introduce the ordinance adding Chapter 10.20 to the Municipal Code. The proposed ordinance would take effect 30 days after the second reading, which is tentatively scheduled for April 19th, 2021. This timeline ensures the ordinance will take effect several weeks before the Independence Day holiday. This concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? You're on mute, Rick. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Earnshaw, for the great presentation. Back to the council for questions. I have a question. Please go ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Lieutenant Earnshaw. I have a couple questions. One is, was there? Did you say that there was a um, a significant increase in um, fireworks uh, regionally? Was you know the 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 stark increase that we experienced in San Mateo was that consistent with other neighboring cities? Uh, it was. Uh, consistent with all the cities in our county, and I even think just regionally, um, even on the East Bay, uh, but particularly there was a number of articles written last year in San Mateo about San Mateo County's increase in those type of calls. Mm -hmm. And can you um, can you help us understand the um, are there are there safety concerns or injury reports um, associated with the, the fireworks beyond just the obvious um, nuisance? You know, I, I, th I think fireworks um, actually affect people in many different ways. There's the potential for PTSD for some of our veterans. Uh, our animals are definitely affected. Um, and then there are those times when people may hold the firework too long and it could explode in their hand and they lose a limb. I don't, I can't recall any incidents in our city in the last few years where anybody lost an, a limb or anything from the firework. But uh, the PTSD is, it, it's actually, there's a study on it and it actually is, is threatening for our veterans. Has that been something that, ha that it, I mean, I, I understand that that's a, a, a study. Is that something that is um, relevant in our in the city of San Mateo that we've tracked or that we have um, more sort of community specific information on? I think that's something we'd have to look into further and just discuss with uh, the, some professionals in that area. Okay, thank you so much. Do we have anybody else with a question? 
Yes, Rick. Please go ahead. Lieutenant Urshaw, who, who asked for you to look at acoustic enforcement? I, b I believe the request came from council, but I'll, I'll defer to uh, Police Chief Barberini. I can answer that. I asked Chief Barberini about that. I think, unless somebody else did too. Go ahead, Chief. Uh, no, my understanding is we did receive that request from council, um, and it may have been Deputy Mayor Bonilla. I, I'm not sure, but we were happy to uh, to investigate that. And I think uh, Lieutenant Earnshaw was clear that uh, we may not uh, – uh, the environment that we have now in San Mateo, fortunately, um, uh, may not call for a, a tool um, like shot spotter, although it does work very well, not intended for firework um, detection. And, um, and again, may be cost prohibitive. Um, it is a pretty expensive fire. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Lieutenant, is there any, any jurisdiction that uses it for fireworks? Uh, when, when I spoke with spot, uh, shot spotter, um, they they do not particularly use it for in any of the cities that they could think of we're using it for fireworks they, they, they won't even license it for that purpose will they um, I well they they did uh, tell us that they could create a heat map based on our calls that come into our dispatch and then if we know where an area that is calling for those uh, the area that's calling for the shots the shot spotter could tell us right away if it was a uh, a gun gunshot or if it is actual firework what's the amendment to the ordinance that you're seeking we so our amendment really is our police officers have had a difficult time with enforcement and taking the the firework confiscating the fireworks uh, when we go out to groups uh, because there's been a lot of confusion with the fire department and whether we need the fire marshal or his de or designee uh, to be with us in order to confiscate fireworks. This ordinance would actually give us a little bit of power with the actual municipal code that we can use to cite the violators, but also to actually take possession of the fireworks uh, from people if they are using them in our city. So what's the amendment that you're seeking? Well, it's creating a it's creating a whole section for us um, that will we don't have this currently in our system in our municipal code. So we are looking to um, use a little bit of enforcement, give a, give the police a little bit of enforcement to use, and actually a citable offense that will be used. It adds the fines, doesn't it? Yes. Okay. Is it not currently a citable offense? So I, I can I can address that real quick. Right now, our reliance, um, council members, on the fire code to uh, to seize fireworks. Uh, that the it's a little ambiguous because the fire code mandates that we um, that we be with a fire marshal or or his or her designee in order to have the authority to do that. It's just not clear. Um, so it's been a it's been a sticky point for us um, in for, in um, enforcement. This amends the code by adding a section that clearly states that per the San Mateo County Municipal Code, fireworks are, um, are banned rather than uh, rely on the fire code to do that, which is uh, um, a little, it's ambiguous and it's consistent with what other cities have in place. Makes it much more clear for us. If I can, Chief, I think it additionally it gives police explicit authority to cite for firework use, uh, to uh, confiscate fireworks. Uh, for any charges up to a possible felony. Isn't That's that correct? Well, and we already have that. I mean, just to be clear, we already have that. We can, there, there are citable, there are um, citable sections within the health and safety code um, and within the penal code, should it rise to the level of a misdemeanor or felony. Um, and we can, we can obviously take enforcement action on that. Um, with the, what's been a, a very unclear um, kind of an area. And it, and it was new to me coming to the city because the cities I had, um, uh, experienced had specific codes that granted the authority of the city to both cite and seize fireworks. Uh, for whatever reason, we've relied on the fire code um, to grant us that authority. And um, while very specific for fire personnel, not as specific for law enforcement personnel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chief. Um, any other council members? Shall we go to public comment? Very good. We're moving to public comment. Madam Clerk.
Mr. Deputy Mayor, I have no hands raised. Okay, seeing none, we bring it back to the council for any final comments and a motion. I am. Um, I, I definitely have heard from uh, constituents that fireworks have been um, throughout the year, not just around the 4th of July, fireworks have been a problem. Um, so I'm delighted we're going to do something about it. And um, I'm ready to make a motion. I, I want to add that I, I agree. Uh, illegal fireworks, all kinds of fireworks are um, deeply distressing and I know that it causes significant harm to animals and other individuals. I just still have more questions about this specific ordinance and how it changes our enforcement ability. You, please ask any more questions you may have. Uh, we currently have the ability to, to cite someone for a misdemeanor or felony depending on uh, whether they possess uh, illegal fireworks, don't we? Uh, there are, I, I'd have to, it, it would be based on health and safety code sections. And then I don't know whether the, the, the basic possession of fireworks would meet those thresholds. I'd have to, I'd have to review those. The, all fireworks are, the, are illegal in San Mateo. And this would give us, a, typically a muni code section is used to enforce that section for the possession of small fireworks rather than um, those don't rise to the level of misdemeanor. Um, Nobody, nobody does that unless, unless you, um, there are thresholds regarding weight um, that would, that would uh, allow for the um, submission of a misdemeanor offense. I mean, the, the sections that you were referring to that would allow uh, cite, citing someone for a felony for possession of a firework, those are not affected by this ordinance at all, right? No, not at all. Those, this, those are this 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 ordinance this ordinance and I'll and I'll, and I'll let uh, Lieutenant Ernshaw expand on it if he, because he did all the research. But this ordinance ad addresses those incidents that would um, not meet the threshold of that either misdemeanor or felonious act. Yeah, and I think it's it's my understanding that the key provision of this uh, ordinance that fills a gap for the city is that explicitly clearly authorizes. Uh, law enforcement chief of police or the chief designee to to seize fire fireworks and that uh, naturally the key uh, behind this is to authorize uh, police personnel to uh, to seize illegal fireworks uh, where under the fire code we've been, apparently been operating under the fire code it, it doesn't provide that explicit authority for law enforcement I, I'm just not understanding why it's under the fire code if if we currently have the authority to cite for misdemeanor or felony, uh, it doesn't make any sense that a police officer wouldn't be able to collect evidence related to either of those crimes. Yeah, I suppose it's um, uh, you're not seizing evidence for the purpose of evidence. You're just seizing the the fireworks, uh, period, and, uh, and and perhaps that's why they are providing this. And, uh, and, and maybe the person isn't cited. They just seize the the, the fireworks. They don't cite them. Additionally, I, I'd like to ask, I mean, isn't it true that some people probably sell fireworks in San Mateo? Are we interested in pursuing that if we see people with large caches of fireworks? Yeah, I, I think, I think we're, we're kind of, and, and what you're describing, Deputy Mayor, would, be, would rise to the level of a, a misdemeanor or felony. What we're talking about here is folks who have, are in possession of firecrackers or small amounts of fireworks that would not be prosecuted as a mis as either a misdemeanor or a felony. This gives us an alternative to cite for a muni code violation, which is essentially an infraction um, and punishable by a fine only. Right now, we don't have that capability. Right. Um, so the police so, would be authorized to confiscate those materials. Yeah. So what we find ourselves is in that gray area where, where we're not taking any enforcement action because we don't have the infraction option. So if we're not taking enforcement action, um, you know, it, 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 it limits and hinders our ability to, to seize the fireworks um, as, as evidence. Now it allows us to do both uh, because the, the vast majority of, of, uh, of fireworks offenses are not filed as either a misdemeanor or a felony. They're, they're filed as infractions via a municipal code. Great, thank you. Do we have a motion? I'll move that we adopt the amendments to the ordinance. Uh, 
I'm not particularly interested in the uh, equipment and our city attorney is yeah. going to guide me on the yeah, motion. So, Please so the do. Mo the motion would be to uh, to introduce the adoption would come later. So introduce the ordinance to add chapter 1020 uh, to the municipal code. Okay, so we have a motion to introduce the ordinance for uh, chapter 1020 to the municipal code. Second. Okay, there's a motion and second. I just want to add uh, feedback and next steps. So that was the first item was to uh, put forth the ordinance. Uh, second was provide direction on whether to pursue further use of audio enforcement technology, which I don't support either. I so, don't either. Yeah. Okay, good. We have a motion and second. On the question, Madam Clerk, could you please take a roll call? Councilmember Pappen. Yes. Councilmember Lee. Yes. Councilmember Gothels. Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you very much. Okay, next is item 20, which I have right here. Um, oh, okay, appointment of our uh, um, interim uh, <laughs> city attorney. I'm sorry. Oh, Good. city attorney appointment, I'm sorry. Good. So we're going to be seeking to appoint our new city attorney, Mr. Prasanna Rasaya. And I, um, I'm going to read a recommendation and ask uh, council if there are any questions and then proceed to this. And I'm looking for the recommendation. Um, and that's going to be in the report, no doubt. So let me get back to this. Big shoes to fill, Prasanna. You know that. Yeah. You've waited so patiently all night. <laughs> it's only the beginning of waiting. At least he only has to wait for five council members. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Five efficient ones, I might add. <laughs> Very efficient with our technology. As we wait on the deputy mayor. Yes, who is evidently Got a computer here that is, oh, it's uh, winding its way through here. Rick is still on the consent calendar. Yeah. Can we go back to that? Okay, here we go. So move. Okay. Thank you. So I have the city attorney appointment here. And what I have is the recommendation and the ordinance. So the recommendation here is to adopt a resolution to appoint Prasanna Rasaya as city attorney, establishing his initial compensation and authorize the mayor to execute the employment agreement. That's the ask. And I don't know if we have a presentation, but the ordinance is attached. And resolution. There were some pranks and hazing. Resolution. First. Sorry. There were some pranks and hazing we were going to engage in first, I thought. Uh, let's go back to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. I'll move that we adopt the resolution. Okay. Motion second. Second. Second by. <laughs> by the other attorney. Moved by one attorney, seconded by the other attorney to appoint the third attorney to the seat of <laughs> city. It's all a grand conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, oh, city and, Mason. and the fourth attorney would like to, to remind you to seek uh, any public comment if there is any. Thank you very much. So um, I don't think we have any questions here. So let's move quickly to public comment. Madam Clerk. I have no hands raised. Very good. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council for any uh, comments they may miss to make before we have a motion. Welcome. We're looking forward to it. Let me um, call the roll. Thank you. Council, council member Pappen? Yes. Council member Gothels? Yes. Council member Lee? Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla? Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Okay, good. Welcome aboard. Welcome. Yep, we have a, uh, a new city attorney. Um, 
Would you like to say just a couple words? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Pernia, and uh, thank you to the to the City Council. Um, yeah, I'm very excited and very grateful for this this opportunity to join a great city like San Mateo. And as Councilmember Gothos mentioned, and I do have big shoes to fill for uh, the retiring City Attorney uh, Sean Mason. So I look forward to our kind of conversations to facilitate a smooth transition um, from him to to me and to conversations with our uh, city manager, Drew Corbett. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to, know the, to getting to know the city and getting to know the community. And I'm uh, eager to get started. So I just want to thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosaya. We look forward to you getting started with your duties here at the city of San Mateo. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're about now to move on to item 21, which will be the appointment of an interim city attorney. Um, and I believe that I have uh, the recommendation is to adopt a resolution to approve the appointment of Gabrielle Whelan as the interim city attorney. Um, do we have any uh, questions? Seeing none, then I would ask for, do we need public comment on this? If there is any. Is there any public comment? Um, yes, and I believe you had Casey Echarte on the line to answer any questions also. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. Um, and I have no hands raised. Okay, seeing no public comment, then I think we should um, move on with the process. Do we have a uh, any discussion or a motion? I am. Point, Gabrielle. <laughs> I'll move that we uh, appoint uh, Gabrielle Whelan as interim city attorney until Mr. Prasanna begins. I will second. Um, Mr. Rasaya. Okay, we have a motion second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Pappen. Yes. Councilmember Gothos. Yes. Councilmember Lee. Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Very good. So we have appointed an interim. And uh, now I think we're down to, and uh, well done, everybody. Thanks for being patient with me. We're now down to reports and announcements. Are there any reports or announcements? Yes. Yes. Well, I would just like to congratulate our deputy mayor on his award from Sustainable San Mateo County as one of the stalwart stewards of our environment. Um, so proud, so proud to know you, proud of your work, and um, delighted that it got the recognition that it deserves. Thank you, thank you very much. Anyone thank you, Rick, for your work. I just wanna say that I wouldn't be me doing what I do without having all the people around me helping to get all the same things done. So as, it, you know, as equal as I receive any recognition, I like to give it away because I couldn't have done any of this by myself. We all do it together. So thank you very much on that. Is, is there any other uh, report or, okay. Moving I just on. want to say that this city won't be the same without Sean Mason. Uh, and he left us better off for his service. Thank you as always to Sean. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Anything else? Yes, I have one. Um, so the San Mateo Peace uh, Alliance approached us with um, an opportunity to sign on to the Mayors for Peace for World Free of Nuclear Weapons, and um, and I would like to propose that we put this on the agenda as a proclamation um, and um, and affirm our commitment to peace. I will share the example proclamation from Menlo Park and um, and I think Patrice can take it from there. That's all I got. Thank you. Madam Clerk. I think we're I think we're looking for um, if council's interested in putting this on the April 19th agenda. Yes, I'm interested. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. 
I see three head nods, so um, we will have it ready for April 19th. Four head nods. Okay, thank you. Thank you and very then, much. Um, Deputy Mayor, I think there are some things on your script you wanted yes. to bring up. Yes. So at this point, we need to talk about uh, SB 612, which is a request that uh, is coming from Peninsula Clean Energy about legislation that's being put forth by Senator Portentino, which would uh, be an improvement in the way that uh, PG, uh, pg e and PCE uh, work on how much our ratepayers pay. PCE is always looking for ways to help our ratepayers. And right now we're all paying anyone who is on Peninsula Clean Energy as their default energy electricity provider is paying what's called on your bill PCIA. It's a power charge and different adjustment. The only difference is we don't get to have any of that energy. So this legislation would say since uh, uh, CCA affiliates, and that's what we are, we're affiliated as a, as a member of the community choice aggregation known as Peninsula Clean Energy. Since we're paying for this resource, we need to have access to it, which we currently don't. So um, Jan Pepper sent me this uh, uh, letter, a sample letter, and I forwarded it to Patrice. And I'm hoping all of you got a chance to see it. Have you received any of you the letter? Yes, let's add it on for the next meeting. Okay, good. I'm all, I'm all for getting what we're paying for. Well, we're paying for electricity that's being created by PG&E, but they're not providing to us, even though we're paying for it. So we, we're, we're paying for what they call um, their legacy energy, which is they bought a bunch of energy enough to pay to, to provide electricity to everybody in their in their their area, right, the jurisdiction. And now people have opted out and gone with community choice aggregators like PCE, which means we're now taking renewable energy through our own electrical provider. And you got four, Rick. We're, sorry? You got four. Okay, good. We're, we're in. For well, Diane wanted to know what we're paying for. I did. And, we're paying for it. We're not getting it. But now we'll get it if this legislation passes. How's that? Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, then. Uh, Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Do, do we, well, what we're asking is to give me authority to go ahead and sign it and send it because it's kind of a, a timely issue. Do it. Well, that, that, yeah, would, be, that would be uh, taking action on an item on the, on the agenda. So, um, would it be would it be in time if you have it on the agenda for the 19th um the agenda is i mean the uh, legislation is moving forth so i have to think i have to think uh it would still be okay uh we'd rather get it in sooner but i think it's within the discretion of the pce representative liaison or within the authority of the city manager to sign that anyway in the past i have been able to sign letters like this as the board member representing the city at PCE. We don't need to take action tonight. Okay, let's do I, that. I, I, I defer to the already standing authority. <laughs> and I agree with that. Okay, good. Then let's move on to the next item. Uh, I'm asking for council's authority uh, to submit a letter on behalf of the city uh, supporting federal infrastructure funding for the 101-92 interchange project. So um, I believe that we've been asked uh, uh, by, um, is it CCAG, Madam Clerk? Yes, I think it's, it's CCAG. City Manager. And that's due okay. on Friday, yeah. isn't it? Yes. yes. They, they've asked us to, to submit a letter to the federal government uh, requesting uh, uh, supporting federal infrastructure funding for the 102 and 92 interchange. We were already going to do that anyway. We were going to do it anyway. Well, were we going to do the letter? We're going to do the letter. So I guess all we're talking about is the fact that we're going to do it. Uh, two two uh, options. One would be to um, express an interest in having the city manager sign a letter and send the letter. The other would be to, I'm not sure when the request for the letter came, if it came out after the agenda was posted, but you could vote to uh, add this as an urgency item that arose after the agenda was posted and vote on that first and then vote on, uh, on, on the letter. So moved. Mr. City Manager, does that sound right to you? Do we, do we know when the request was made? 
I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look. I'm not, it was late last week. I don't remember if it was Thursday or Friday, but it was, it was late last week. And I don't know if I have, Oh, okay. I just got a message that it was Friday. Yeah, um, was so it was after the agenda was posted. Yeah. And if so we can authorize this, it as an urgency item then. Yeah. And it's due this Friday. So you don't, you don't have a meeting before then. So, uh, the first vote would be two votes. The first vote would be for the council to approve an urgency to take action. And then a second vote to, uh, take, take the action. I move Good. that we take action on this as something that was requested after we posted our agenda and that we take it up as an urgency item. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, it sounds like, on the urgency of the matter. Yes, uh, Council Member Wilfels. Yes. Council Member Lee. Yes. Council Member Pappen. Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Motion carries 4-0. I move nope. that we authorize uh, signing the letter in support of it. That's a motion. Second. Is that a second? Second. Okay. Council Member Gothels? Yes. Council Member Pappen? Yes. Council Member Lee? Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla? Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Okay. And I believe that is uh, most everything. I think we're about to move to adjournment. I would like to mention that very sadly, I got news this afternoon of the passing of our former assembly member, Gene Mullen, Kevin Mullen's father, um, who was a great man, a government <laughs> teacher at South City. Sorry? Okay. He was a government teacher at South City High School for many years. He uh, became city council member in South San Francisco, and then he became uh, our uh, state assembly member. He served with uh, pride and dignity and always exercised the best judgment, in my opinion. I really supported Jane, and I'm, I'm very sad to inform us all of his passing, but I would ask for a moment of silence on his honor. Okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.